All right, welcome and thank you for joining us for another segment of the Jane Irrigation Training Series. And today, uh, we're branching out into a subject that I find uh, uh, really interesting because we're talking about uh, alternative ways to provide irrigation for landscapes. And um, stormwater for rainwater runoff, you know, is is kind of an interesting subject for a couple reasons. Is one, it solves uh, a landscape problem in some areas, some of the time, but more importantly, it helps from a conservation standpoint that to start thinking about, I think, a little bit more. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, we've got Lance Sweeney to uh, help us along with this discussion and lend some of his experience to the, uh, to the presentation today. You know, uh, most of you know Lance, he's the president of Sweeney and Associates, and has over 30 years in the design business. But um, you know, one of the things I really appreciate about Lance is he's really an out of the box thinker. He's done designs in the US of course, but also China, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. Uh, he's really got a worldwide perspective on this and, uh, and that's always great to see. Um, the other thing I really appreciated about Lance is, uh, you know, I've known Lance almost 20 years now and it doesn't matter whether or not I call and say, hey, will you help me out with a webinar? Or uh, maybe you know, we did a landscape chat on Twitter a few years ago, or even two, uh, two springs ago, I said, hey, will you come be a uh, speaker at our spring seminar? These are homeowners in San Diego that wanna learn about uh, irrigation. And you know, this is not gonna be business for Lance, but he's on board and he'll, he'll take his afternoon on a Saturday to help educate people on irrigation. I really appreciate that. So anyway, Lance, well, to uh, our webinar. Thanks, thanks for coming today. Thank you, thank you, Richard. Thanks for the kind words. Yeah, so listen, um, you do have this big perspective uh, on irrigation and landscape and the business in general. And before we jump into stormwater, I, I did want to ask you, you know, how's, uh, how's things looking from a landscape perspective, you know, with COVID and things happening in the economy. I know that's one thing everybody's a little concerned about. And I was thinking, you know, before we got on, you've got this big perspective or a bigger perspective than most of us have. Uh, what, uh, what do you see out there business-wise right now? Surprisingly, we've seen little, little change in business. And in fact, some points we're, we've been busier than normal. Um, it hasn't seemed that the, the COVID situation has really hurt us from a, from a you know busyness on on projects we're, we're getting new projects in we're proposing on projects um, we saw a couple projects go on hold you know for a little bit but uh, I think half of those came back so uh, yeah I'm, I'm optimistic that it, it, it probably won't affect us from that standpoint um, you know knock on wood who, who knows we go keep going on and lockdown, then maybe that will change. But so far it's been, it's been, been steady. Yeah, well, it was interesting because, you know, if you recall, we had dinner late February and we were talking about what a good year it was going to be. Yeah. And then, uh, then March happened. Yeah. And uh, I, I remember calling you at the end of March and you were saying, you know, a uh, couple jobs uh, got tentative, but six months out, still looking really good. You were one of the few people that early on said, you know, I don't really see a change and I don't see it changing right now. It you were right steady. back in March. Yeah, yeah, it seems steady, and we're still we're still proposing on new projects, and the projects we've been working on are still going. So it it seems good. You know, I'm, I hope it continues. Yeah. Okay. Great to hear. So, um, listen, let's jump into stormwater, and yeah. uh, I I don't know, is it storm water harvesting? Is it rainwater harvesting? Is this all the same thing we're talking about? And, and what is that? They're actually different things. Um, when people talk about rainwater harvesting, they're generally talking about capturing rainfall specifically for the use of, you know, cons conserving water and, and, and using the water in their gardens and being proactive and reducing potable water use. And it's, you know, it's, you, you hear, you it works better in different parts of the country than others. And obviously Southern California, we get all of our rain in the winter time and it's really hard to store the water to when we really need it. Um, whereas stormwater is a whole nother situation. Stormwater is a concern because many agencies are looking to reduce or eliminate uh, storm runoff off of properties into storm systems that then outflow into you know, rivers or dry streams or into the ocean. And they're trying to reduce that. And that's, 
that's it's because there's a lot of pollutants that that can do that can bring in put into the the ocean and the and the water lakes and the water you know, and the rivers. So they're trying to reduce that stormwater in many places of the country. I mean, if you go back east, you go to, you know go to Florida, go to you know even parts of Texas, you'll see that big developments have ponds next to their prop next to the developments, and that's where the stormwater goes until it can percolate into the ground. And that's a that's a big part of it too is aquifer regeneration. So that's a different strategy than, than rainwater harvesting, which is kind of focused on actually, I'm going to capture the rain to use it. And it's driven by a desire to do that, whereas stormwater is driven by the desire to eliminate storm runoff. And uh, it's become a big topic in Los Angeles uh, area. And uh, Los Angeles requires projects of over 500 square feet to look at stormwater um, uh, elimination or reduction and uh, in some cases that could be something as simple as I got a slide here I'll show is uh, um, um, it could be as something as simple as with a residence sorry <laughs> a little little a little slow on the switch here I uh, hope you can see that so this is this is actually from the uh, uh, Los Angeles' LID, you know, Low Impact Development Manual. And you can use rain barrels, which are very simple, you know, catchments. They, you can look just like a barrel, be a barrel, and they, you can use that water to water your garden, your landscape manually. You can have the water go into planter boxes rather than go out into the, into the gutter. Uh, you can do rain gardens, which are pretty much depressions, you know, low areas of the garden where the water can be directed to percolate into the ground as opposed to going off into the street. Um, they, you can do these dry wells, which are kind of like French drains, where the water is directed into, into a subterranean uh, 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 catchment, but is intended that it, it, it drains into the ground. It's not like a cistern in that case. And then, of course, they also uh, really promote the permeable pavement, which, you know, when the water lands on it from the rain, it can soak into the permeable pavement as opposed to sheeting off and running off into the gutter. Um, so that's like, that, that's a stormwater management for a, a residential project. Um, but, you know, there, it, it's required for all projects now. We're doing a lot of hillside development homes and we find this very common on, on almost every project now, there's a stormwater component. Um, and there seems to be a break point that we see with it where um, if, if you do uh, an LID system of stormwater catchment and you do it gravity feed, then you avoid some um, uh, plan check and permitting through the health department. Whereas if you put a pumped system in, then the health department gets more involved and they want to see the plans and there's more scrutiny involved. And of course, builders want to go the easy way. And so often what you get is these typical gravity fed systems like I have a picture of here. This is actually a project that uh, was sent to me and they said, yeah, well, you know, we want you to want you to design this system. So, you know, you check this, check this LID system out. And what's interesting about it is, is they're looking to put in two cisterns of about 2,600 gallons each um, to capture all the roof water. And they were assuming in this calculation that they would be getting an inch of, they would capture an inch of rain off of the roofs and paving surfaces and direct it into this, into these two cisterns. Um, but when you look at the area that they've decided they're going to distribute the water into, it's only 1,220 square feet. So when you calculate that, they're actually going to put 6.8 inches of water onto this slope on the back side of the property after it's already rained. And you know, obviously the, the issue there is stope, you know, slope stability. If you saturate those soils, you know, it can lead to slope failure. And we think that's a big issue. Um, the other issue is it's a purely a gravity fed system. The, the elevation difference, they, they show it here at, on, the, on the, their little calculation that they're giving you a three foot six inch, you know, elevation difference between the line and the bottom of the cistern, which calculates out to a 1.5 PSI, which no valve will operate at that. Most drip tubings and drip emitters won't work at that. So you really have very little control over the flow of water onto this slope. Um, so this is what we see the engineers doing quite a bit as just a simple, you know, here's a plan. 
Um, but we recommend that they take a little bit different approach and actually pump the water. And instead of applying the water to this one small area, which is calculated as part of the LID requirement, how much area they need to, of landscape they need to distribute it, we like to promote that they do the stormwater over the entire site. I mean, you could probably, you know, easily do 10 times the landscape area, and then you're distributing that water much more, uh, you're putting a lesser amount of water over the whole site as opposed to concentrating a lot of water on one, one location. And, um, and that's worked out really well for us. Um, you know, obviously that doing the whole site versus a small site reduces the, the amount of water you're applying. Um, the water is treated like gray water for plan check purposes. The, the health department looks at it as that it's gray water now, which I'm not really under, understanding why they determine that. So everything has to be drip irrigation, subsurface or bubblers below grade or, or things like that. They don't want any surface water. Uh, it has to be at least two inches below ground or, or under mulch. And so it changes the system a little bit where you might have tried to use some overhead spray or you're gonna end up using more drip. But we're kind of forcing ourselves into drip anyway more and more with the water use, uh, you know, model water efficient landscape ordinances pushing drip more and more. Um, so that, you know, we look at this as a, as a solution. It does trigger the need to go to plan check through the health department for a permit for that, but uh, it, it makes more sense to us. Yeah, so this brings up a whole host of questions. One, um, you know, just uh, originally when I first heard about, you know, stormwater or rainwater, I thought, oh man, how am I going to store enough water to <laughs> irrigate through the, right? And then, uh, but now I'm realizing that's not really the goal. Uh, the goal is to keep it out of the drains, right, where it's going to pollute the oceans and do some other trouble uh, and maybe get quick, uh, more quick the water table. Am, am, am I right on that? Yeah, exactly. And the other thing to consider too is one of the things that you have that the engineer has to do storage of the, the storage container for the water is the largest expense in the system. You know, um, water storage tanks are expensive, especially if you bury them in the ground. You have to dig a big hole. You have to anchor them down, and, and that type of thing. And when they size these, they like I said the the LID the low impact development guidelines say you have to capture. Uh, three quarters of an inch of rain in, during a rain event. And, um, but as we get our rain, especially here in Southern California, we'll get, a, we'll get a rain and then it'll be three or four days later and then we'll get some more rain. So these tanks are intended to be, you know, drained before the next, the next storm event. They're really not intended to store the water for a month. They're intended to, you know, let the water go back out uh, slowly and, and uh, therefore you end up with, you know, empty tanks for the next rainstorm. Um, so that's, that's different than what you might think about a rainwater harvesting system where you might be trying to capture rain and store the water for a longer period of time. And we certainly have projects like that. We are working on a project uh, in the Caribbean right now where they, they, they use desalinated water for their potable water. So rain, collecting the rainfall is really important because the water is so much more expensive than, than what it would be if you know, we were on, they were on, the, on the mainland. So, uh, but those systems, because you look at more rain during the periods of time that uh, you, 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 were, you, know, you would be irrigating. So let's say in the summertime, um, you, know, you get a lot of rain, so you can, you know, it, It'll offset some of your irrigation water. And then as you go into the dry season, which is the winter in, in the Caribbean and in Florida, you know, you can, they have this rainy season. You can store up enough water to get you through maybe a month or two of using water. So that, that, that adds a lot uh, to the, the re return on the investment. Um, so these systems are really intended just to capture that storm water, not let it go into the storm drain, disperse it into the landscape so it goes into the ground. That's the intent. Yeah, so a few years ago, I was involved in a project at uh, Pelican Hill. The EPA got very involved with this too. And it was a nice project because we were grabbing all the storm water, we were storing it, but we had a golf course to move the water to, right? Mm -hmm. So we had a really big landscape. So even if it was raining or we were getting those Southern California rains that weren't hard, uh, the landscape was really benefiting. And for the most part, we could move that water in a couple days from a storage tank to the golf course. But you know, this is a five-star resort. And after a couple of days, the smell of that water 
uh, was not uh, conducive to what they wanted to represent the property as. Um, what, what do people do about that? What's the normal amount of time you can store this water? Uh, help us out with some of that, please. Yeah, yeah, that's the problem is the water, if you're not treating it and, you know, it, it, it can go septic and start to smell. And um, we had a project at a university campus that we were using captured rainwater off the roofs and it was stored in the basement. And the procedure to go into that room was to open the door, turn on these big fans to blow all the smell out of the room before you went in. I mean, it, it, it did smell. And, you know, and it's because, you know, it depends on how you're going to treat the water. Uh, you know, depending on what your collection surface is, there can be a lot of organic debris that gets into the water, you know, th you know that, that, that can cause the water to, to turn really quickly. You really can't store it for a long time. Uh, you can treat it, but that gets expensive too. You know, there are, I, I, I've done a couple projects where they have done treatment systems in the basement of the house that, that treat the water, uh, but that does get expensive. These stormwater systems, like I said, are really only intended to store the water for a few days, get rid of it quickly. Um, one of the things you can do is um, try to prevent things from getting into the water. So they have these first flush diverters that the first bit of rain you get, it, it, it doesn't allow it to go into the tank. It, it diverts it into, you know, some other, you know, they don't want you to put it off site, but let's say you put it into a, 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 a French drain or something. And that takes the leaves and that first flush of bad stuff off. Uh, and then the water that goes in after the first, the first few minutes of rainfall is then a little cleaner. Um, yeah, it's a tough situation. We, we, we've seen this before. Uh, I know we worked on a big project at the Getty and they had a fire tank that the water started to turn bad in. And so we worked with them to design a system to pull water out of that tank and transport it to a slope way away from the building. And then that enabled them to turn the water over more frequently and keep it from turning you know, smelly. Uh, so yeah, treatment, there's all different kinds of treatments. They, they can get really expensive though. Um, yeah. So Lance, um, so I, fortunately, uh, you know, we had, had that opportunity to tour the uh, Getty and uh, we spent uh, no time that day inside the museum. We spent it all outside in the gardens. There's quite a few of us yeah. that uh, went on tour with you and uh, you put the irrigation design in there and you talked about it that day and it was fascinating. And I know that Last summer when we had all those big fires around the Getty and everybody talked about the fire suppression system and mm -hmm. that it would work. And, and, and apparently this uh, cistern, it was like, what, a million gallons or something? And it was a million gallon from what I understand it is in the basement of the building. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, um, and how fast do they turn that water over? Or? We were able to, by using it to irrigate the slopes, turn the water over every three to four days. So, because there's a lot of slopes, obviously, and we were pushing the water out to cover the slopes. Um, so, yeah, it was good. It, it enabled them to turn the water over frequently. And, you know, and I, I think that's the big issue with, with collecting any kind of water is, you know, it, as you store it, if, if there's debris going into it or organic matter going into the tank, it, it's going to sit in there and, you know, it'll be like pond water after a while. So, you know, that, that is something to consider. If you're going to go with a long-term storage of water, then you really should be thinking about treating it. You know, there are ways to do it with like UV light, you can do filtration and I mean, nobody wants to do chemical, but you, you could in fact chlorinate it, I guess, if you, if you wanted to. And there's, there's a whole bunch of people that do do that type of work. Yeah, we did have a viewer ask, uh, you know, would a UV filter help for the smell? And sounds like it would. It would kill the, kill some of the things growing in the water. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That would be one way of doing it. But once again, all those things get, get expensive. Um, and you'll start looking at return on investment. And the return on investment, we've done projects that we have said, you know, calculated that the return on investment is as few as seven years on a system where we know they get rainfall and we can calculate it out. It's not just how much rain they get, it's when they get it and what the duration between rains are. You know, here in Southern California, we'll go 170 days without rain, right? You know, I talk to people on the East Coast and they'll be complaining about a drought. And I'll say, when was the last time it rained? And they say, three weeks ago. Right. I'm thinking three weeks ago in California, it's nothing. But that's, that's a drought to them because, you know, that it's obviously they're, they're dependent on that rain. Uh, we, the project that we had that could pay off itself in seven years, 
the the average duration between rain was six days. So every six days they got rain, and we were able to collect that water and then you know start using it. The problem is if it rains enough to collect, that the landscape you know probably isn't ready to accept any more landscape. That's why these stormwater harvesting systems are kind of frustrating. Is we catch this rain in in January and the plants really don't need it because they've been rained upon, and with the water efficient landscape ordinance driving planting to lower and lower water use you know types. We, the plants really don't need any more water than, the, than what they got during that one inch of rainfall. And so applying more to it is more of a dispersal system. And I, and I, I think that's, you know, I, that example I showed off that slope, I think those plants would end up suffering from it. Now, one of the, the questions is well, how you might actually achieve a pump system and make it work. I'm going to share my screen again. Um, we, we recommend these three-way valve systems, and these are really great because they're automated. Um, so what I've got here on the screen on the, the left is, is the cistern, and we would put a submersible pump in the system. And you could put one, on, you could put one that's not a submersible, but generally these are the easiest. Um, and then we also connect up the three-way valve to the water supply from the residents. And we have a, a submeter because that's required now on, in, in many areas. We have a master valve and a flow sensor. And then it's plumbed to the three-way valve. And the three-way valve is essentially an electric valve. It's a, like a motorized valve that is tied to a control panel and sensors that are placed in the cistern. So when the irrigation controller tells the irrigation system to run, this valve will already be set in the right position. So if there's water in the cistern, it will motor, the motor will turn, the valve will switch over to the water coming from the pump system. And no one has to go down and flip a switch or turn a valve or activate anything. And then when that water that's in that tank is low, like during the summer especially, right? There's no water in the tank in Southern California, it doesn't rain then the system automatically switches back to the potable supply. And this is a really nice, simple system. These are check valves that we have to put on. This is a requirement of LA. They, they want a check valve coming so that way you don't inadvertently, if this thing fails in some way, don't push potable water this way or, or, or potable water into the cistern or pump water into the, you have a backflow, so which I didn't show. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> but uh, but these are really simple systems that uh, that work very well for us. Um, and like I said, then we that water goes to the overall irrigation system as opposed to just one small area. Yeah, no, that's a great way to do it, right? Because uh, you're not having to uh, figure out where your water's coming from. It's all from the same valve to start with, and then uh, you're using it's master valve in a sense pulling yeah. from a certain water source and then your individual valves after that are letting it go around and we've done more elaborate ones where we actually have a line that comes off of the the connection point before the water comes to the three-way valve from the potable side and that goes to areas that we have to use spray irrigation on for whatever reason um, and so it's kind of a hybrid system. It has some areas that will always get potable water and then some areas that will get the, the water uh, from the cistern. Uh, I have a picture of, a, of some couple cisterns. Uh, so these are, this is a, a company that supplies turnkey water harvesting systems and they can provide tanks that are above ground, which kind of industrial look in the most places don't want something like that, but we've had some uh, we've had some parks and and uh, I we did an H E B which is a grocery store chain in Texas and they wanted the tanks outside the store. It was kind of an advertisement. Look, we're capturing on rainwater and using it. Or these are these are tanks that can be below grade. And I've seen these are these are like six foot, eight foot diameter tanks and they're buried below ground. Um, so you know cisterns can be almost anything. A lot of times uh, on buildings that we do in the Middle East they actually build concrete cisterns. It's actually galleries within the, within the building that they fill with water for the, the tanks. Uh, and they actually will try to do three days worth of storage. Uh, wow. That's the general rule for them. And it's not because they're collecting rainfall, it's that because sometimes the water delivery system is intermittent and they don't want to be caught without water. 
So when you're uh, installing these systems, Lance, what are some of the things to watch out for? You know, things that, uh, tips that you can pass on that'll save some people some time down the road. Um, there's a couple ways, you know, if you don't use the three-way valve system, some people, uh, you know, want to just dump the water into the cistern as a makeup water, because you always need makeup water. Yeah. Uh, most of the time, these systems, are, you know, depending on the region, are not going to be 100% self-sufficient. You're not going to be able to capture enough water that you'll never need water from some other source. Um, I, I, I've had people suggest to us that we use that system on some occasions. The problem with that is there's some advantages, but there's disadvantage. One of the disadvantages is you get water delivered to your property through your water meter under pressure, and and actually pressurizing water in the state of California is like the largest use of the energy in the state of California. All this water that's delivered to our homes, that doesn't come, you know, free. I mean, it's either pumped up to water towers or water tanks that are up on hills. But anyway, it's all pumped. So moving water is expensive. And when you dump that water into your tank, you've lost all that stored energy. And now you have to repump the system. So we try to avoid that because why pump 100% of your water only because you're going to have captured rainwater that may be 10% of your overall use. So, you know, you're, you're kind of trading one, you know, uh, green technique for another. I, I don't, I don't like that. The advantage with that though, is if you do get water in your tank, that is a little bit suspect. It's maybe it's gone bad. When you're adding potable water to it, fresh water, you can actually cleanse the system and clean the system up a bit. Um, so that is one advantage. But I, I think the cost to pump is re really a, a big one. And then, like I said, with these gray water systems that we have to count this water as in LA, you really need to look at putting stuff under the ground, um, you know, or under mulch. And that, and that gets critical to make sure the drip is done that way. And all your, if you're going to put bubblers on your trees, and the trees have to be in some kind of a, a system below gray, and they're manufactured ones, and there's homemade ones that you can build. Um, the other thing is making sure your pump, you, you can only design your system to match what your pump's going to put out. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if your pump, if, if you're, submersible pump only puts out 10 gallons a minute at the pressure you need. Your whole system has to be designed for that. Even if your on-site potable water could deliver more, you're, it becomes the, that becomes the limiting factor in your design. Um, yeah, that, that's a really good tip. I could see myself, you know, after the fact going, oh. <laughs> yeah. Right, uh, which makes it sometimes harder to do a retrofit system, right? Because if you know, if you, you know, if if you say, "Well, I got all this drip system, I'm gonna I'm gonna start capturing rainwater," and the system was designed to work at 20 gallons a minute, then you have to have a pump that does that. So it it, it has to be thought out. Um, the other thing is when you're doing these LID systems for submittal to the the the, the county health they want to see all of the systems. So you have to like take what the engineer has drawn and put it onto your plans and identify it all. They want to see it all because they're trying to understand how it's working all together. And they want you to identify the areas that you're using it. It's very critical to them to understand that you're using enough area because uh, they do have some minimum requirements there. Right, and then how about the maintenance on these systems, Lance? Is, uh, is, it, a, is it a hassle? Is it uh, pretty easy to maintain? What do you think? Depends on how clean the water going in is. Uh, in some cases, it can be you might have to, you know, clean that cistern, you know, once once every, you know, couple years maybe. Uh, in some places, you may not have to do it very often at all. But the, uh, you know, but that is that is the biggest thing is you have to, you know, anything that gets into that cistern is not going to come out unless you go in and get it. We had a project in Miami where for whatever reason, the first flush diverters were still letting leaves in and we were getting a lot of leaves in the system and they would have to go in and, and remove the, you know, the leaves and things that had washed into the system occasionally. The other thing is these systems, these submersible pumps, you don't want to put the, you want to make sure you're, you're not taking the water directly from the bottom of the tank because that's where a lot of the things settle. And so you want to have the, you want to have the, in, the intake for the pump above the bottom of the tank it's the water will be cleaner up there and it'll reduce the amount of things that get drawn into the system you have to have filtration too obviously you know when you're using these drip systems you, you know you always have filtration but it's even more important if you're using this kind of water because you know it's more susceptible to have debris and organic material in it 
Yeah, so this is all kind of around the subject of uh, alternative sources of water, right? Yeah. And I know in talking, especially to some uh, commercial property managers, they're always asking me, you know, what about the, uh, the, the condensate from the air conditioners? Mm -hmm. Can we use that? Is there a way to do that? And I think you've actually had a couple really interesting uh, uh, projects in which you've done something with that. Can, can you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, we've done uh, we've done uh, AC condensate reuse. Uh, actually, we did the Burj Khalifa Tower in Dubai, the world's tallest building, and it was designed to capture all of the uh, condensate water for the air conditioning uh, from the whole tower uh, and to be used for for irrigation and I, I think some other uses as well. But obviously, the irrigation was the big thing. Um, that system is partially working right now. They haven't. I don't think they've completed all of the interior uh, of those buildings and it kind of depends on the interior being complete because otherwise they're not going to air condition it. But uh, that was interesting because the building was so high, we couldn't just run a pipe from the upper floors down. We had to like stage it in tanks along the way, otherwise the pressure buildup would be too high. Um, there are some places that are concerned about AC condensate because uh, the storage of the water has, uh, AC condensate for whatever region is or for whatever reason is a place where Legionnaires disease can develop huh. and so we've had some projects actually where they told us no you can't use it even though it was originally thought to be used. Um, the other thing we've used is blow down water which is another cooling water and that's a lot of big projects the big buildings and things have this uh, these cooling towers where you know people don't realize that they're actually doing evaporative cooling. They're actually putting the water and it's coming down through these tiles and it's evaporating and it's cooling the water. And uh, that water, uh, e because it's evaporating, will slowly get harder and harder. It'll actually get more and more minerals built up into the water. And eventually they have to get rid of that uh, because it's, it, it no longer works well. And so we did a project in Las Vegas where we were using something called the dolphin clean water system and that was passing electrical current through the water and flash flashing uh, uh, precipitation of the heart of the dissolved solids in the water then they would remove those those solids and then that water was clean enough to be used for irrigation and uh, wow. that was a, a lead project where we had to work with the client to calculate how many plants we could support with the water they were anticipating getting out of the system because they didn't want to have any makeup water because lead if you have makeup potable water then they assume you're using potable water so that system didn't have any potable makeup water it all came from that uh, that system so it was a pretty interesting project yeah, very. Uh, it's it's really great to see uh, the different ways we're solving some of these, uh, you know, the, the water conservation issues or that, that we're experiencing. And what about green? Is this part of this discussion too? Green roofs? Um, yes, I, I mean, I, most green roofs have drainage underneath them. And so therefore you can get water off of a green roof. Um, and that water can be collected and used. It's going to have organic matter in it. Obviously, it's going through the through this through the plant, and then any kind of dead, you know, or dead, you know, there's always some organic uh, things underneath the plant itself, you know, leaves and you know things like that, and then the soil. And so the water is is can be used. Um, yeah. um, I, I you know I haven't seen anything directly with that though yet. I haven't worked on something with that, but I can imagine it working um, as well. Yeah. But it, there is an efficiency of collecting water. One of the things when they calculate how much rain and how much water you're going to be able to collect, you have to look at the efficiency of the collection surface. And a lot of these, uh, you know, if you have roofs that are, uh, that have uh, tiles or, or, or things like that, the water moves pretty easily off them or, or a standing seeing steel roof or something like that, the water moves pretty efficiently off of it. But if you have a, a, a roof with a rough surface, let's say like the tar paper shingles or something like that, you're not going to get as much water off of that because it's going to, you know, that it'll hold a certain amount of water and it won't release at all. So uh, there are some efficiencies with different roofing types. Yeah. So uh, Lance, any final thoughts for anybody who's thinking about on one of these projects and uh, as they're you know, looking at a property or maybe even their own home or a, a project 
project they're working on. Uh, uh, where, where's a good first place to start? Well, I, I think there are, there are these packaged, you know, systems, and that's a big help to the designer. If you can, you know, the, the, the like I, the screen I showed you, Watertronics has the, these Sky Harvester things or other manufacturers that have different things like that. It's nice to do a package system. You have to get everybody involved in you know, storage. Generally, we avoid designing the storage because it gets a lot more complicated than you would think. Yeah. Um, I did a project down in, in Carlsbad and was at a high school. And I estimated how, I, I, I spec the tank, but I said, well, the engineer is gonna have to look at how we put this in, make sure it's okay. And I underestimated how much anchoring they had to do on these tanks. So they, they dug a hole that was, humongous to put these tanks in. So I really try to avoid that. And you might want to consider doing the same. Let the engineers design the tanks. We can design the pumps. We can design the controls. We can let that water out. But the engineers are designing the tanks and the catchment systems. I never get involved with collecting the water off the roof because that's a whole other trade. But let them get the water to the tank and you take it from the tank. I think that makes more sense. But then look, look to these package systems because I think they really, uh, really simplify things. And they've got the experience uh, to, to help, help you go through the design. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's that's really uh, helpful. I'm sure uh, uh, for everybody. So we we had another question that came from from the audience, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and the question is, what would be the best UV filter and or treatment for a bladder system that we have for uh, rainwater catch for an old historic building in Miami Beach? Wow. Um, I, I I don't know. I can actually tell you which would be the best. There are several companies out there that are water quality treatment companies and they can do package systems. Um, we've seen UV systems, we've even designed packaged RO treatment systems. So there are package systems, fairly small footprint type systems that you can use. Um, I, I, would, I would look up online those type of services. Um, I, could, I can't recommend one off the top of my head. Yeah, oh, that's great, thank you. So uh, Lance, as always, uh, you take a subject, water, water, storm water, and make it very interesting. Uh, you, you did a great job today, and I wanted to say thank you. Uh, love the diagrams and uh, all the information you supplied for us as well. Uh, certainly uh, has me thinking a little differently about uh, storm water and how to use it. So thank you, and I want to thank all our attendees for joining today an hour of your time and we appreciate that we want to be sure we're getting good uh, information to you so thank you uh, hope you succeeded and uh, lastly I just want to say that uh, we have all our recordings this is actually our 50th uh, recording uh, that we've done in the past few months uh, so Lance thanks for being part of that being number 50 uh, they're all on the Jane website janesusa.com you can check them out there and we're also on all the popular podcasts now so you can find us on Google, Spotify podcast channels now. Search uh, Jane Irrigation and uh, you can listen uh, on your way to work. So anyway, thank thanks you, very much everybody and thank you Lance. Thank you Richard, I appreciate it. Thanks for joining in. Bye-bye.